Before we begin, I'd just like to start things off appropriately with acknowledgement that I'm recording this video on the traditional homeland of the Anishabe, Haudenosaunee, and Huron-Wendat, and I thank these nations for their care and stewardship of this land, and offer my sincere apologies for everything else. In one of the establishing scenes of the dynamic between John Franklin and Francis Crozier, the AMC series The Terror, the former remarks to his ward early in the show, you must not give him hope, explorers breathe hope, and in many ways he has no idea how depressingly true this is. What about you, Captain Boyd? You don't need meat? Oh no, he won't. Only as a last resort. It's a pity. Ravenous is a film by Antonio Byrd concerning a garrison of Union soldiers in the post-Mexican-American War at the mercy of a seductive intrusion by a deserter with the powers of something described as Wendigo, a creature who grows stronger through cannibalism. Side note, would like to mention, the film Ravenous uses the term Wendigo to describe a supernatural monster. This, however, in Algonquin mythology from which it derives, is not what this is. Wendigo is instead described as the worst crime a human can commit and the spiritual effect it takes on them. Uh, and Algonquin people are not particularly fond of the characterization in media, of which Ravenous is not unique, of the Wendigo as a literal monster, giving one supernatural powers. Thank you to a uh, fellow YouTuber, ThoughtSlime, who found this out the hard way, so I didn't have to <laughs> make the same mistake. So I will acknowledge that is what Wendigo is, is not how it is portrayed in Ravenous. However, um, for the purposes of this video, I will be describing it roughly as such, just insofar as the text of the film it chooses to portray it, even though it is not a particularly sensitive portrayal of indigenous beliefs. My apologies, and thank you. <laughs> How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? Help me to recollect. The Lighthouse is a Robert Eggers film about two maritime workers in New England. The tensions of employer and employee tested by a vague supernatural force and mounting cabin fever on a tiny island where they work. You must wonder what we're doing here in your part of the world. And The Terror is a limited series created by Sue Hugh and David Kedge, uh, Ked, Kedge, I'm sorry, David, David K, Dave, David K, concerning a fictionalized account of the real-life Franklin expedition in search of the Northwest Passage, itself beholden to cannibalism and madness, but also in this tale, as well as hunted by an insatiable supernatural beast. What could have done that? There must be a bear. Why these stories? Why do we tell them again and again? Why do these tales about 19th century Britain and America resonate still in the 21st century? Beyond their aesthetic similarities, these three works are in accord and in conversation with one another. In the deeper themes and theses they put forth about their common subject, each has something to say about Britain its colonies, the hierarchies of classist and capitalist societies, the psychology and sociology of the men living in these conditions, and the inherent existential horror and despair that was always just beneath the surface, beneath this ideology of work, ambition, and false hope that keeps the wheels of power spinning. In this essay, I hope to demonstrate how the narrative and construction of all these three horror classics positions hope of the false sort, as a key ingredient which keeps its characters locked in a vicious cycle of misery and dissatisfaction. But only the terror, it seems, offers its hero an escape, an escape which demonstrates the artificial constructs on which he and his men built their lives, and which ultimately spelled their doom. <coughs>
As with a lot of things in history over the last 3,000 years, we can blame Aristotle. In an introductory scene in the terror, the lowly caucus mate, erroneously known as Cornelius Hickey, speculates on the hypothetical rank of the ship's dog, a dog who, unlike the men of the lower decks and lower classes, can go wherever on the ship it pleases, and thus in a way is physically freer, or in Hickey's reckoning, more privileged than its human masters. It's a comment that draws attention to the artificiality and potential injustice of the class structure, but it also reveals that Hickey's feelings on the matter is distinctly of resentment, not specifically of righteousness. If you didn't already know, you might be disquieted to understand that the basic scheme of how men have laid out civil human civilization has changed very little since the days of ancient Greece. Aristotle's so-called great chain of being has survived the rise and fall of empires and religions, and though he certainly didn't invent such concepts as patriarchy and divine hierarchy, his pontifications on such things have influenced the powers that be of many societies, including my own, for centuries after his death. In Aristotle's reckoning of the world, the celestial bodies and the gods existed on the top of the pile, with men beneath them, beneath them, other terrestrial creatures and objects, and at the very bottom, women. Amazing. Even dogs, whose name is a low insult against men, used in fact in the Terror and the Lighthouse and Ravenous all together, rank higher on the great chain of being than women. Yet, even within this restrictive hierarchy, even greater divisions evolved in time. It is important to keep in mind that this chain only extended a place in the divine order of things for those within a certain group of the civilization who practice it. Woman may have been lowest in the Western hierarchy, but the foreigner of the Western hierarchy was always lower still. And among the strut of men, rigid barriers of caste and class have segregated who was closer to God in power and influence for generations. Barriers that still shape our lives today, whether we realize it or not. <coughs> Hellenic hierarchies became medieval feudalism. Feudalism industrialized and democratized to become imperialism and capitalism. The three works we'll discuss all take place in the 19th century, the conditions of that era being both unique and also informative of societal shifts and momentum both before and after. Though class remains an ever-present factor in the lives around the world today, the 19th century was a time when the Great Chain was more strictly observed and tied directly to one's rank and profession, and reinforced by religious and nationalistic values. However, in this era, more than before, as capitalism and industrialization were on the rise, there was another ideological influence from press upon the men of empire, both high and low. You might call it the promise of upward mobility. Americans would probably call it the pursuit of the American dream. The British Empire had long enshrined it as an ambition for greatness. What one might metaphorically call it is hope, and false hope at that. And hope becomes hunger. The Lighthouse and the Terra, in particular, are preoccupied with hierarchy and the simmering emotions of the men laboring under it. The titular Lighthouse serves as a literal ascent towards power and satisfaction that the Thomases Wake and Howard in the film grapple over constantly. While the Terror is dealing with the chain of command in the British Navy specifically, it also juxtaposes the biblical Jacob's Ladder with Aristotle's great chain of being. And the key feature of this hierarchy is imbuing a sense of entitlement. More than mere desire, but a sense of what one is owed, and more specifically what white cis men, no matter how low in class station, are owed. Boyd, in the movie Ravenous, begins his story technically promoted, but also socially demoted after his act of cowardice in war inadvertently led to a strategic advantage. He is banished to Fort Spencer with all the other cast-offs of the army, and yet, because of his rank that he is accustomed to, he persists for a while in feeling superior to his new peers. Calcoon, likewise, dying of TB, feels such bitterness 
at the life he was promised. He steals the literal life force from every person he comes across. Not uncoincidentally, starting with an indigenous man. That distinction of race is important because he's frustration of class between white men is that of a perceived equality, which is not applied to people of color, other outsiders of society. <coughs> Thomas Howard in the lighthouse rankles at being under Wake Thomas Wake Thumb, feeling he is owed equal treatment. And Mr. Hickey, from the start, feels that he is owed a better life and a better station just by virtue of the minimal effort and initiative no matter how underhanded he demonstrates and it's very telling also that his breaking point comes after his captain chooses the well-being of an indigenous woman over praising hickey's performative efforts to ingratiate himself as this entitlement is routinely frustrated by the immovability of class strata it builds up like a toxin in these men until it becomes an intolerable agony. It is also important to consider the power structure of gender in the 19th century because gender is and always has been just that, a power structure and not much more. If you were labeled a man, you in theory had the most mobility and power in society, whereas a woman's only agency was in marrying to a more comfortable station. But as a man, there came not just the ability, but expectation. Men of the empire in particular were impressed not just with the standard of manliness, a standard we might still recognize today, but also the aspirations of being great men, great explorers, war heroes, great thinkers, conquerors, leaders, recipients of great legacy. Nowadays, we would replace these kinds of terms with things like self-starters or self-made men captains of industry other such meaningless things we see this demonstrated most straightforwardly in the terror on several class levels in the characters of franklin and fitz james but also frustrated <coughs> <coughs> but also frustrated through crozier and hickey both men despite occupying different levels of rank and responsibility are convinced that they are owed more than they have. Crozier and Hickey, that is. Both, it's clear, have been denied repeatedly the objects of their desires. The impenetrable barriers of class made irrefutably clear to them. The looming threat in the terror is the beast known as the Tunbach. Since the Tunbach has no basis in Inuit myth and was a narrative device foisted upon us by the infamous Dan Simmons, did write the book based on this series that this series is based on. No, I have not read it. No, I will not read it. No, I will not. It is prudent to view the creature as a metaphor. So I submit to you, really, it is the frustration and resentment simmering in Crozier and later Hickey that is drawing the wrath of this creature. The true flaw of the Franklin expedition was their addiction to their, their social composition, their hierarchies, their predetermined roles, and their imperial ideology. However, closer examination of the text shows us that their seething righteousness and entitlement was the ailment that was in fact eating them from the inside out, producing a metaphorical putrid stench that drew a literal monster with similar appetite. To take a quote from David Graeber's Bullshit Jobs, the main political reaction of our awareness that half the time we are engaged in utterly meaningless or even counterproductive activities, usually under the orders of a person we do not like, is to rankle with resentment over the fact that there might be others out there who are not in the same trap. Resentment. Order is maintained and solidarity is quashed by fostering resentment. Yet, because conditions are so exploitative, resentment is an unavoidable byproduct of such hierarchy. Ravenous in the Lighthouse, meanwhile, show the American mutations of masculine classist philosophy. But there, the mask of any nobility has slipped entirely, revealing only naked, grasping ambition. Colquhoun turning to cannibalism to restore his health and grant him supernatural vitality speaks to his entitlement to more life, to more power which he directly couches in the colonial creed of manifest destiny. Ravenous' comment on patriarchy, however, is a bit less focused, except in what all three works share in absentia. 
the loneliness of masculinity that manifests as desire. All three of these stories have some pretty gay moments. And to go back to Thought Slime's video, like you could honestly read Ravenous as quite straightforwardly a queer metaphor. <laughs> Yet I think a reason for all of this goes beyond straightforward homosexuality. Numerous psychological studies have noted strong evidence showing the deep emotional harm infants can incur when they are merely deprived of human touch, even just for the first several months of their lives. Human beings are pro-social creatures, and we derive emotional well-being from touch and trust. It follows that a society where men are socialized to be hard, emotionally repressed, and homophobic to any hint of intimacy with other men for most of their lives may suffer from similar ill effects. This is also why women throughout history have been comparatively better off regarding their emotional intelligence. With no political power, competition, or pressure to live up to an independent ideal, women have had more freedom to be more emotionally honest with one another. The lighthouse, most of all, is preoccupied with the socialized behavior of men, where its crudeness and emotional detachment represent a language of dominance, which mirrors the symbolic hierarchical power of the titular lighthouse itself. The only female presence in Ravenous is a lone indigenous woman, a savage, outside the hierarchy, who largely washes her hands of the principal cast and does not get involved by the end of the film. Women in the lighthouse are only a deranged and lonely Thomas Howard's sexual fantasy of mermaids. The terror, meanwhile, shows us both the indigenous outsider and some of the women within the empire, with Lady Franklin and Sophia Craycroft. And it isn't shy about demonstrating what little sway they have over, over society in spite of their wit, persistence, and confidence. The Lighthouse shows us a nightmare scenario of how hierarchy of work and patriarchal conditioning have left men catastrophically unprepared to grapple with their own loneliness and have taught them that the only way to interact with other men is with competition, mistrust, and push to extremity, violence. This is not a bug of such hierarchy. Even today, it's a feature. Ravenous shows us the pure ideology of entitlement, which drives the men laboring under hi hierarchies of empire and capitalism represented through cannibalism. And the terror is a clever synthesis of both. But what all three have in common is what men within the hierarchy are fed, and the curious and devastating effects this has on the mind and the body. Uniting all three stories is the subject of diet and starvation, both textual and subtextual. Ravenous and the terrors focus on what these men eat and the horrifying implications, of course most obvious, but The Lighthouse too emphasizes the consumption of alcohol, here as a catalyst of unrest and a tool of the oppressor. Wake tells how drink was a way of keeping sailors happy in harsh conditions. However, Howard adds that it also keeps them stupid. Historical record undeniably agrees, and the treatment of workers throughout history is very illuminating about a society's values and anxieties. Both Terror and Lighthouse concern or allude to a sailor's profession, a line of work so brutal and dehumanizing to men, and men had to be literally kidnapped to participate in it. Ravenous provides the next most deadly profession, the army. The character of Lieutenant Hodgson provides us with notions about diet in a late episode of the Terror. Diet in all of its meanings, as a cornerstone of understanding the Terror and these other stories, and the hierarchy of their shared society as well. For background, we must understand the very unwholesome conditions of health amongst the navies of 18th and 19th century Europe. Stephen R. Bone writes in his book, Scurvy, after subsisting for months on maggot-infested ship's biscuits made putrid by storage, briny unwholesome water, moldy cheese, roach-ridden porridge, and stale beer, the crews became weakened 
and succumbed to an array of illnesses. And chief among those illnesses was the malady known as scurvy, a constant anxiety amongst the crews of Erebus and Terror, but also one created by not just the inhumane conditions of Navy vessels, but by the inadequate designation of the provisions provided to the ordinary sailor. Because rarely did the higher ranking crew members go hungry or malnourished. And furthermore, this disease, unleashed by inequality, became a distinct marker of class. To this day, studies have found, have found clear medical connections between one's access to good nutrition and one's brain function and physical and mental health, which not coincidentally fall along class and racial lines. Bone continues, although after months at sea, the entire ship's company would be eventually afflicted with scurvy, it was the common sailors who showed the earliest and most severe symptom. Even after prolonged time at sea, the officers seldom fell prey to scurvy to the same extent as the crew, and the disease was often thought of as an illness, particularly of the lower class, reflected in such slang as lazy skivvies or scurvy dog. Most ships during the age of sail went to sea with hundreds of sailors and press gang men and came back with a small fraction of their starting number, overwhelmingly due to disease and maltrition. But though they fared better, higher-ups were not much wiser about what constituted a healthy diet. By and large, dietary items were favored that could be preserved, and more importantly, kept a man upright. Among the lower decks, grog and rum were rationed and promoted particularly in desperate times to keep men happy and noble, and for all levels, protein-rich foods were prioritized over produce. It's interesting also how this carnivorous diet became valorized and epitomized as something primeval and distinctly masculine, to the point that even today we have supposedly intelligent people trying to defend it as something other than a misguided kind of rugged individualism. It is also fundamentally very unhealthy for the human body to consume nothing but protein, which will begin to shut down and, yes, develop life-threatening scurvy, or at least scurvy-like symptoms, without a diversity of vitamins and nutrients. And in both the terror and ravenous, it is clearly the most stubborn and desperate endpoint of this philosophy in survival situations to turn to cannibalism, a practice which, though Ravenous's case allegedly grants one renewed vitality through Wendigo magic, again, I am so sorry, will in real life eventually poison you with continued consumption. Sorry, Hannibal. There is also the matter discussed earlier of the homoeroticism of these works, and of men being literally starved of affection, but also in the case of who is healthy and who is not. Lieutenant Irving, Private Reich, and Thomas Wake to, are particularly toxic examples of those repressed by stringent diets of religion, patriotism, and toxic masculinity, respectively. But in contrast, we have the simple and laid-back Private Cleves, who's partnered with the indigenous woman Martha. And on the terror, we have the loving queer couple of Mr. Bridgens and Mr. Peglar, both of whom appear to have had no ambitions other than their own personal contentment. In both cases also, though they are white men, are in some ways ostracized from the mainstream, clearly aware that their society does not care for them or their lifestyle, and thus has no pretensions to anything more than they can create for themselves. Again and again, what these men consume physically is juxtaposed in the narrative with what the Empire wants them to consume philosophically. What is the rhetoric of queen and country, or manifest destiny, if not empty proteins and stimulants? What is the deprivation, belittlement, and frustration of Hickey, Howard, and Colquhoun's class and economic ambitions, not hunger? What is the stoic lack of support and community validation, if not starvation and malnourishment? And pushed to its extreme conditions, the end is scurvy, self-destruction, and a slow death. Western civilization is giving us scurvy. Please clip that out of context. And the stubbornness of this ideology will not abandon these men even when they are pushed to their breaking points. Because that dependence on the lies hasn't left them. The lighthouse and the terror more, most explicitly, also draw a comparison between the diet of empire and substance addiction. Something that cannot be discarded until one is weaned off it.
There is something the terror has which these other tales do not, what many other stories do not. It has the case of Francis Crozier. None of our heroes live to see the end of their tale, except Crozier. He just has to first accept his own death. Beyond the carrot and the stick, we see the inherent addictive behavior woven into the fabric of capitalist society. Men who will gamble everything just to gain even a little ground, who will submit themselves to agony for the hope of getting their justice earned. And when this long shot fails, as it always does, they still persist. And when persistence becomes too demoralizing, they turn to more tangible vices. Addictions which numb, distract, or comfort the bitter, rejected man. Thomas Wake in the lighthouse has become a fanatic for his position as the keeper of the fire. But also, he cowers in fear of it. He's desperate for company in his misery and routinely drinks himself stupid to comfort his existential and interpersonal anxiety. And likewise, Howard can't help but watch, wakes mania, and becomes transfixed by the power of the lighthouse. In Ravenous, we see a menagerie of addictive behaviors at Fort Spencer that provide comfort to these castoffs. However, it is Calhoun's addiction to human flesh that has eclipsed his identity, and it supersedes all morality in achieving more and more influence, mirroring the behavior of the addicted. Studies show that, that the saying in vino veritas is really a myth. In truth, the sober self is obliterated by heavy drinking. And these works show a variety of perspectives on this idea. The men of Ravenous as Fort Spencer drink to forget their exile and disgrace. None more so than Knox lives constantly in intoxicated oblivion. In the lighthouse, it becomes clear that the sober self of the company man the learned masculine individual, is itself the toxic trait, and only in drunkenness is vulnerability brought forth. Yet, conversely, in the terror, the alcoholism of Francis Crozier brings out the latent resentment towards his superior. That resentment was a byproduct of the fostered ambitions and closed class stratum inherent in the empire, is exacerbated by drink to the point of suppressing Crozier's competence and even his will to survive. The more he drinks, the more brazen and ravenous the Toonbach becomes, only retreating from the hunt when Crozier finally resolves to sober up. And Silna, the indigenous woman, then tries to return the creature to its natural state of being, i.e. being bound and beholden to a community, but it doesn't work. Physician and leading addiction expert Gabor Maté will tell you that your addiction is the behavior you do to be able to function in your everyday life. So consider the more depressing one's circumstances, the stronger the vice. If you watch carefully in the series of the terror, Crozier basically goes through the 12 steps of AA. <laughs> that is essentially his journey. His wake-up call comes when the Toonbach, you know, the Toonbach, the monster I've been talking about, you know, the one which has been feeding off the toxic presence of British, but more specifically, the ambient bitterness of Crozier in particular, who kind of has a face that resembles Crozier himself, after this creature attacks the ship and nearly kills Francis's only best friend, Mr. Blanky. He literally decides to go cold turkey that night. It reminds me of in the novel of Stephen King's The Shining. Jack Torrance's wake-up call to get sober is when he drunkenly hits a child's bike with his car. And this scene is, in fact, inspired by Stephen King dealing with his own alcoholism. He similarly had an epiphany uh, when he looked in his trash can one day and saw that he had dozens and dozens of empty beer cans and was perplexed about where they all came from. The seriousness of the addiction was suddenly made very clear by how grave things had become and how disastrous they might have turned out when things become very personally upsetting. Figuratively, that path to sobriety is a path to deeper sobriety. In the terror of the artificiality of the system Crozier lives in, clarity about the men of Terra and Erebus and how completely lost they all are, acknowledgement of their humanity outside of the anonymity of the Empire, their emotional and spiritual needs that they have only ever been fed 
with sugar water, if at all. Grosier begs them for his forgiveness, and he gives his own in return. And finally, he faces the metaphor of his addiction and kills it with a metaphor for the shackles of, of the hierarchy. He kills the metaphor with a metaphor. It's the only way to kill a metaphor. And he puts his faith in a higher power, true love of his fellow man, more holy than the church or state ever had pretense to be in his life. But then he doesn't die. For the mercy of Silna, an Inuit woman, an outsider of Crozier's world, she shepherds him to a new life beyond the society that binds us. This is where the terror diverges from these other films. Boyd, like Crozier, sacrifices himself to slay the supernatural beast of this rapacious empire, but he dies. And in Ravenous's final moments, we see the general unknowingly partake in the stew made of Colonel Knox, unknowingly partaking in the cannibalism, implying that though Calhoun is dead, this will go on. The Lighthouse is a Greek tragedy through and through, where Howard and Wake are doomed to be destroyed by their addiction to the system, learning only too late what folly they've participated in. But the last scenes of the terror are distinct and ambivalent. One. Crozier is free. He has obliterated everything he ever knew, burned every bridge back to his home. He isn't even Francis Crozier anymore. He is only a Gluca. He could not go back or risk further poisoning his own soul and dooming himself to a short life of misery. But unhitched from the chain, what is left for him? What is left for any of us? In the end, Crozier is gone. Gone from the world he once clung to. Freed from the agony and stupor of addiction beyond vanity, beyond the edges of the map. But is he reborn? Or is he a ghost? We see him last hunting for a seal through a hole in the ice, exploiting an animal's hope in order to kill and consume it through a breathing hole. And yet, it is a scene of serenity and surpassing beauty. Crozier cares for an Inuit child and is a part of the community. And though he does not look happy, he seems more unburdened than ever before. What hope, what real hope is there for any of us beyond the false, selfish, promised hope of this society? The lighthouse showed us the grim fate of those who cannot free their minds from the chain. Ravenous showed us that even Peric victory of an individual will amount to very little. Only the terror showed us path to grace, but only for one soul. It also showed us how much might have been spared if real wisdom had prevailed, if it had been inherent. It showed and humanized the cost of Western civilization's hubris and exploitation among the men it alleges to safeguard. I guess the overriding question is, what now? Is this the most we can envision for the future? We've diagnosed the disease, but can only conceive of its ruinous effects. And in the terror's case, one man's narrow and desolate rehabilitation. I joke, but is it really easier to imagine dying homoerotically in a bear trap? Or to have your liver plucked out by gulls? Or have everyone you ever cared about killed by a monster? Or by starvation and cannibalism? Than to conceive of a world beyond the end of capitalism. Is there a future where not just Francis Crozier is saved? Thank you everyone, and thank you for bearing with me if you if you are watching. I know it's been a long, long, long time getting this done, and I've hemmed and hawed and, and done many drafts of it to not very much effect, I think, but glad to finally have it in some state of completion. And I would like to uh, highlight in particular a big help uh, with this has been the online fan event uh, known as Terror Camp. Uh, that's becoming an annual event. I believe there's a new one happening this year. Fans of the Terror 
uh, many of whom are like much smarter people than me and students or educated people doing some fantastic essays uh, about subjects brought up in the terror uh, so I'm incredibly grateful to them they are cited below anyway I hope you enjoyed uh, and I hope this inspires you I think I was underselling it I just think it's like one of the most underrated pieces of television of like the last 30 years it's truly one of my favorites and just genuinely one of the most complete and perfect little mini series ever so thank you as always i have a patreon but yeah anyway i hope you're all well i'm very sick <laughs> at the moment of recording this but things are good i think and i will be glad to have this uh edited and recorded and out to you as soon as possible everyone stay safe i hope things are getting better cheers